Now we're going to be looking at the fruits of the Spirit at verse 22. So verse 22 through 23, we'll be covering the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now what's important to understand is that, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is not the same as the work of the Spirit. That's important to understand. So a lot of people, they confuse the work of a Christian with the fruit or the work of the Holy Spirit. Now in basic doctrines or beginner's discipleship, I've told you the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit. So I recommend for you to listen to my discipleship videos on the fruit of the Spirit as well as the other one concerning the work of the Spirit. So the thing is concerning about work is that what we notice right here, the work of the Spirit is where the Holy Spirit is working, is operating. When we talk about the Christians as well, the work of the Christian, let's say soul winning. A lot of times we will confuse that, the work of the Christian with soul winning, and then we'll confuse that with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's not true. So you got to realize this. We cannot uh, confuse the two together. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the fruit that the Lord blesses in your life after your work. So the idea is this, is that what the Holy Spirit is blessing upon the Christian, and when the Christian, he's doing his work, he's doing whatever for the Holy Spirit, he is yielding to the Holy Spirit, and then the result after that is a fruit. So hence, you become a fruity Christian as a result. So, that's the fruit of the Spirit, is notice right here, it's what happens at the end, what the Holy Spirit blessed in your life, not your current work. Many people confuse themselves as a fruitful Christian just because of the work you're doing. Now that will preach right there. What does that mean? What that means is that there's a lot of Christians because they're like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Look at all the works that I've done. Look at all the works that I've done, but they are not a fruitful believer. That's important to understand. Do not confuse the work, your work, or the work of the Holy Ghost with the fruit of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is all the other actions and workings the Holy Spirit does, not just in your life, but in everything out there. So the job and the work of the Holy Spirit is to comfort, it's to guide and lead you into all truth, and etc., etc. But the fruit of the Spirit is something that He puts in your life where it's planted, grown, and then the end result is shown. And, that, and hence we see you are a fruitful Christian. Okay, that's as best as I'll explain it. Let's now look at the fruit of the Spirit. So in order to see if you are a fruitful Christian, you got to look at these. This is the best verse to see if you're a fruitful Christian. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, remember, Paul is contradicting verses 19 through 21. See, he's talking about the works of the flesh. Now, I find it interesting. He called the works of the flesh differentiated from the fruit of the Spirit. He, different, he differentiates flesh and spirit as well as work and fruit. I find that interesting. But anyway, let's return over here. So he's now contrasting the fruit of the Spirit. The first one for the fruit of the Spirit is love. Oh, we're all going to love that word. Now, this is not to be confused with the world standard of love. You know what the world standard of love is? Oh, I love you after you fornicate. That's the world standard of love. The world standard of love is, let's get married. Oh, I love you, I love you. And then two years later, after they've been through their romantic phase, Romance is confused with true love as well. Love is actually where you are, not, the world's kind of love is selfish. It feeds themselves, makes them feel good. True love is where you're selfless, where you don't feel good, but you do it anyway for the person. So do you do that with your brother and sister in Christ in this church? Do you do that with your family member? Husbands, do you do that with your wives? Wives, do you do that with your husbands? Children, do you do that for your parents? And parents, do you do that for the children? Can you honestly say, I love you, brother and sister, just because they did something nice to you? Just because they made you feel good? See, that's the world standard of love. 
True love is where you completely have a selfless action, especially at moments that you don't feel good, and you're there at church for them, helping out the brother and sister. Now, that's true love. Okay, so because we all fail in this fruit of the Spirit, we all know that we got, we got some fruit to work on, right? The next one is joy. Joy. This is one of the most coveted things in the world that people want is joy. That's what they're all looking for. And again, the world standard of joy <clears throat> is related again to selfishness. Everything, you notice where everything pleases the flesh, they confuse love and joy. What makes me feel happy? But you got to realize this, the feelings of the flesh are only temporary. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. Feelings come and go. What is true joy? True joy, you can guess again, is found in being selfless. What is joy? J is for Jesus first, O is for others second, and you're at the bottom. That's true joy. You might say, how so? How so is that when you actually prioritize God in your life, you will always be a happy person more than any other person in the whole world. Why is that, Pastor? Because when you're doing what God wants, you're not trusting in your own ability or some object to keep pleasing you because those things come and go. But God is eternal. His plan and working in your life is eternal as well. So in every step you take, you can be at rest and take comfort that God's giving me what's best for me. And God's way of doing things is to put you through a misery, through a trial first, and then the end result, he makes you feel more happiness than you ever felt before. And then you, when you look back, you realize, I thank God that I didn't go my route. Because if I went my route, then I would have come across more problems. But if I went by God's route, this is why I'm happy today. What's the greatest example, Pastor? The greatest example is me. I started out with nothing when I came over here. And I became a... a now, at my, uh, now today, I'm more happy than all my years combined previously. Even my time at my dad's church or at Dr. Upman's church. This is my happiness today. It's not the most comfortable that pleases my flesh, but it is the most happy happiness in my life. It's like a parent with children, you know. Having children and baby is not easy. It doesn't make your flesh feel comfortable, but you never felt more happiness before in your life. That's the same thing. It's selflessness. Okay, the next thing is concerning peace. This is probably the second most coveted thing in the world. Jesus Christ once said at the book of John, if you want to study more on peace, I would highly recommend reading John 16. But Jesus Christ once told his disciples, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you, but what I give. So that's a great verse, of one of the best verses in the Bible. Because Jesus said, when the world tries to give you peace, right, who to vote for in office so we can have more peace. Look at the liberals, how much good it did for them. You know, do you think they had peace? No, they were freaking out when Donald Trump became president. You know, they were throwing liquor bottles against the wall, crying. And me and the brethren, we were just doing Bible study that night. Now, Brother Sean might remember that. And we're like, oh, Trump won. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> and we were just enjoying it. And we were at, you know what we were? We were not panicking. We were at peace. Amen. Everybody, was, the whole world cried out, oh, there's no peace. We're going to die. I just pray to God that maybe he'll become president again in 2020 so I can see their reaction again, you know. I just, okay, but anyway, all right. So forget that. I'm not saying Trump is a great guy, but trust me, I disdain liberalism more. <laughs> okay. So peace is not found in what the world gives to you, who's voted in office, or for alcohol, for example. Everyone wants to drink that so that they can attain their peace, their stress relief. Peace is not found through a therapist or a psychiatrist. Amen. Jesus promised you a peace better than the what the world gives to you, he said at the verse. It's what I give unto you. Why is Jesus the most peaceful life you can ever live? Because whether bad or good, you know that everything's going to be all right, Amen. that God's in control. You don't have to figure out for yourself. Paul even one time said, be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer 
and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. People don't have this. Well, if I have all the money in the world, then I'll be fine. Do you see those rich people have peace? No, they don't. They always need more. A lot of them commit suicide. All of them keep looking at their cell phones. You know what's going on at the stock market and all that. Okay, let's see the next thing here. Long-suffering. If there is something that should not belong in the fruit of the Spirit, it's this word. What does this mean, Pastor? Literally, like what it says. Boom. Long, you suffer. Now, if I was an NIV translator, I'd cut that word off of your King James Bible. What does suffer mean? It means to put up. It means to suffer. Long means a long time. That's the fruit of the Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit is not, as we covered like today's preaching is one of the best examples, a fruit of the Spirit is not where you jump ahead the gun and you feel like you have to take shortcuts or pass judgment to make a ministry even bigger or to cut off a problem in the church. That is not suffering long. Suffering long is literally you have to put up with the pain, somebody being a problem in the church, or you have to go through smallness in the services, and you can't, you're tempted to compromise, you're tempted to use fleshy tactics to build up the ministry, but you can't do that. That's suffering long. Being patient with someone. Some pastor might say, man, I got the worst members in the world. Well, you don't have long suffering. You should not be a pastor then. A pastor, he, he's got to have the fruit of suffering long, because why? God suffered long with you. The Bible says that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right, if this is not a happy word, but this word will be one of the most life-changing experiences is patience, patience, and more patience. How so, Pastor? If I went to a shortcut, I probably would not get the fruit today. This fruit is developed by suffering long. And I mean long. Long, long time. If I went through a shortcut, do you know how hard it would be to enjoy a church service today? If it was not done rightly? How do we get this kind of people suffering long, doing it the right way so that everyone can have the right seed in them so that we can enjoy the right fruit at the end? Everything done rightly. I mean, if you think that I'm in the wrong, then go to those big church services that did shortcut. You think you can enjoy a church service there? No, you don't feel the Holy Spirit at all over there. That's right. All you're going to hear is Brother Sean saying amen in a 2,000, 5,000 church room. That's it. Yeah. All right, so true story, by the way. Okay, so let's look, at, let's look at the next part of verse 22, gentleness. <laughs> oh, no, no. Bible believers, I'm in James only, dispensational. That's right, I'm bold. I'm going to kick every heretic out there. No, gentleness, that's not the right word. Yeah, gentleness. Gentleness. Is it right to expose and be tough? Yeah, you should. You can't be a wimp. You got to be tough. You got to expose wrong doctrine. You got to confront. You can't hesitate, especially when you're given a position of authority. You have to take charge and judge matters. You definitely have to do that. But the thing is right here is that if, you, if we never saw gentleness in your life, then you are not right with God. We know then that by your attitude, when you're preaching against sin, when you're street preaching and calling out names and uh, deliberately developing emotions within people to get easily stirred up and angry at you, and we never seen this in your life, we know that you're not right with God. I would like to ask some of these jerk street preachers this one question. Have we ever seen gentleness in your life in street preaching? All right, now you go home and pray about that for a while. Sure, we have to be tough. We have to be bold. But if there was no gentleness, then we know that there's something wrong with you. Why? Because that's not a fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Gentleness. 
We need to see that. What, here's a great example in street preaching concerning gentleness. What you should do is that if somebody calls you out a name and then persecutes you, what do you do? What's gentleness? Gentleness is putting up with that person. That's what gentleness is. Not getting all mad and then calling and name calling them in return. I believe in preaching against sin, but street preaching is the best evidence to test your gentleness with people. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best test to stir up you being bold and to fight. And it's also the best test to work on your gentleness and understanding of others. All right. So gentleness is definitely put to the test, especially in church. Church is one of the greatest evidences of gentleness. And if we don't see that in a Bible-believing church gentleness, then you're in trouble. Church should have a lot of gentleness. You know why? Because it's working with people. That's your chance with finally working with people and showing them how much you tenderly care for them. Paul even said that when he started his church, he had to do it with gentleness as a nurse cherish, cherisheth her children. When I started in the ministry, what I have to do, I had to have that gentleness. I couldn't beat the members over their head. Where were you at street preaching? I was doing it all by myself. You know how tempting it is to do that? But that is not a fruit of the Spirit. A fruit of the Spirit is to be gentle with them because they're baby Christians to begin with. And they need that tenderness and sensitivity where they can grow themselves. A baby, uh, if you think that a baby will become tough when you start beating its skin, then it's not, then it's going to become mentally unstable. How it can grow in proper foundation is it starts with gentleness. You notice how I'll try to do that, right? After I preach a hard sermon, what do I do after that? If any of you have any questions after this, feel free and don't hesitate to talk to me after this. I try to do that. What? A little bit of damage control, right? It's because a newcomer for the first time, what are they naturally going to think? Oh my goodness, you know. Uh, who is this preacher, you know? I, I can't even speak to him. I feel like that he's going to preach against me. No. I understand where you came from at the beginning. Why do you think God sent me here to start a church then, huh? <laughs> he sent me here to start a church because he knows what kind of people you are. 